Hello once again everybody and uh, we welcome you to the Sloan C webinar on using quality scorecard for the administration of online programs. We are very fortunate to have Kay Shelton with us today. Kay Shelton is the Dean of Online Education at Dallas, Dallas Baptist University. Her program now facilitates the delivery of 54 programs and majors which are fully online. Teaching online since 1999, Mrs. Shelton holds a certification in online teaching and learning instruction. Her education includes an MS in education emphasizing online teaching and learning from California State University East Bay and a PhD in educational leadership, higher education from the University of Nebraska Lincoln. She has published and presented on the best practices for teaching online, quality online course development, and the development of online education programs, including a book titled An Administrator's Guide to Online Education. She's also a mentor with the Sloan C Certificate Program and has served as an advisor and consultant uh, regarding online education programs for several peer institutions. She received a 2010 Sloan C Effective Practice Award for the Quality Scorecard. What I would like to do now is turn the microphone over to Kay so she can start her presentation. It's all yours, Kay. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. Today I'm going to be addressing the following topics. I want to introduce you to the Quality Scorecard. I want to explain the history and rationale, why I think it would be a great idea for you to use the scorecard, and how to use the interactive scorecard that Sung C has developed, and then uh, discuss a little bit about a handbook that we have as a guide for completing the scorecard. Excellence in online education is a very special interest to me because I've been entrenched in it for over 13 years and I fully believe a quality education experience can be delivered to a student whether they're 10 miles away or 10,000 miles away. In fact, from the very beginning, my institution was committed to offering quality online education and was determined not to skimp just because students were at a distance. And we really do have a quality program. But we need to be able to substantiate that claim. I wrote a book that was published in 2005 that Suzanne mentioned earlier with uh, George Saltzman, a colleague at Abilene Christian University. We researched best practices for administrative issues and worked with programs all across the country that were considered at that time successful and, ex and excellent. Each chapter of the book focused on a different issue, leadership and strategic planning, policy and operational issues, faculty support, student issues, uh, technology, and marketing. The final chapter was supposed to address quality. And we, we really just never could get our hands around it. We spent several months trying to really, really nail it down and finally just ended up tossing the chapter and, and moving on with the book uh, because we really just couldn't define it. At the time, there was very little literature in the literature that could even guide us as online administrators on a quest for quality. So as I was completing my doctoral work at the University of Nebraska, that thought stayed with me in the back of my mind the whole time. How do we determine quality on a scale that we can all agree upon? I wanted to develop some sort of measuring tool to identify elements of quality within an online program. According to the literature, quality assurance of educational programs is still one of the greatest challenges in higher education today. But it's important that we continue to improve on this in light of the Spellings Commission results and funding reductions and definitely increased public accountability as well as it's becoming more competitive to recruit students uh, with the boundaries being removed between states now that we have online education. I also believe that a commitment to continuous improvement supports faculty buy-in as well as, it's, as well as it helps us meet accreditors' requirements. At the same time, many have called for the standards to be more clearly identified. I have 10 different articles and studies cited here on this slide, and there were really a, a lot more, too many to put up on the slide. There are rubrics for online courses, such as Quality Matters rubric, but not a rubric or a scorecard for an online education program that clearly is defined by standards. Assurance of quality was a concern from the very beginning, with many believing that online teaching and learning was suspect. 
yet the projected growth is not slacking off anytime soon. Online education administrators need tools and guidance for assessing their programs to make sure they're meeting standards because we owe that to our students. Quality assessment in higher education is often identified by rankings in the annual U.S. News and World Report, results for the National Survey of Student Engagement, and accreditation requirements and standards. Rice and Taylor in 2003 found that 88% of colleges and universities surveyed affirmed that they were engaged in some form of continuous improvement strategy. But I bet if we asked that today, it would be near 100%. I found in the literature that some institutions actually have begun to use quality initiatives that businesses use, such as Total Quality Management and the Malcolm Baldridge Award. I examined many studies and articles and publications from groups that suggested various uh, standards and best practices, and one of the most commonly used and cited was the Institution for Higher Education Policy Study Quality on the Line in 2000. They identified 24 individual quality indicators chosen to be absolutely essential by various respected online education leaders of higher ed institutions out of an original 45 indicators that they were able to uh, find in the literature at the time. While the study called each indicator a benchmark, there are in reality attributes of an online education program to indicate overall quality. They were not measurable against other institutional results. Their studies sought to prove that distance learning um, can be quality learning. Because the report was the most highly referenced in the literature, I wanted to be able to use these 24 indicators as a starting point. I selected the Delphi method for the study to determine what quality standards are relevant to online education programs today and would be necessary for creating a quality scorecard. I actually looked at a grounded theory um, process and nominal group technique, but it wasn't the best method for having experts located all over the United States. The Delphi method was, the fir was first developed in the 1950s by Dalkey and Hilmer for the Rand Corporation to be used as a forecasting tool. It is a structured flow of information using a series of systematic surveys and reciprocal feedback used to gain consensus from a panel of experts on the selected topic with the rubrics being fed back to the panel of experts and iterations occur until consensus is finally gained. This study took 18 weeks with six different survey rounds and each survey round lasted about two weeks. My study population was online education administrators in higher ed. My sampling frame was a group of experts identified by the Sloan Consortium, which has always been an organization highly respected for its work with quality online education initiatives. They became the gatekeeper to help identify the experts who were to have published or presented on topics of online education and have it had at least five years of experience in online ed. And I wanted a broad representation of various types of institutions. I invited 76 experts and 43 completed the first round. I wanted you to see how much experience this expert panel had. 83% of the panel members had nine or more years of experience in the administration of online programs. And you can see that 69% had 10 or more years of experience. This further strengthened the, the validity of the study since online ed has only been around for about 15 years or so. My sample distribution was very close to what I had hoped, with it maybe being just a tiny bit heavier in large public institutions. We were fortunate to have a large for-profit school as well that participated in the study, as well as several large and medium and even a few small uh, different types of institutions. We averaged about 93% of participation for each round, which is well above a 70% uh, participation rate that actually was recommended in the literature when you uh, looked at Delphi studies. The panel was interested in the work and they certainly didn't participate because of the compensation because all I had to offer was a $25 uh, honorarium. I believe they participated because they felt that this was much needed and that we could all benefit. So for the study, I addressed the following questions. Were the standards that were identified in that original IHEP study in 2000 still relevant today for online programs in higher ed? 
what additional standards should be included that would address the current industry, and if additional standards were going to be suggested by the, by the panel, would they fall into the already identified themes or would, that, would actual new themes emerge or new categories? And then what values would be assigned to recommended standards that would ultimately yield some type of numeric scorecard for measuring quality online education programs from an online education administrator's perspective that could also be used to support strategic planning and program improvement? For the instrumentation, I used a combination of open and closed questions and the first survey concentrated on those 24 standards that have been identified by the IHEP. But additionally, I asked the panel to begin suggesting indicators that they felt were missing from the original 24. I also asked if there were additional categories that needed to be added. I used SurveyMonkey, which is an online survey tool, and I used the uh, five-point Likert scale that you can see here to determine consensus. Each survey round was open for two weeks, and after one week, a follow-up email was sent to remind them to finish up the, that, that part of the study. The data was analyzed each time to develop the next round of survey, and we looked at, I looked at mean scores and then the additional standards that they had suggested and had to code those into the next survey. After analyzing and verifying the data collected from round two, then round three survey was developed uh, to include those items that had um, achieved a mean score or less of 4.0, but that 70% of the panel members had, had actually um, chosen those. So I wanted a pretty high uh, level of consensus, which a, a mean of four out of five was, was pretty high, but also wanted 70% of the panel to have agreed on that. After analyzing and verifying the data in round three, then round four was developed and so on, uh, the first four rounds concentrated on the actual indicators and then round five and six concentrated on wrapping up a few that still had not achieved consensus or uh, concentrating on the actual scoring method for the scorecard. So I'd like to present to you the results of that by each of the, the actual research questions. The first questions were the standards that were identified in the original 2000 study, uh, were they relevant today? And out of those original 24 standards, the panel said that 23 were still relevant and that one was not relevant at the time, but it was completely revised to be made relevant. 22 of the 24 were actually revised in some form, and then two of those original 24 were not revised. So. Stay with me on this. I'm going to try to walk you through how we ended up with 70 indicators. So there was an original 24, but the panel combined two of them into one, so that takes us down to 23. And then they took two other indicators and believed that they needed to be split out into two additional indicators, which takes us now up to 25. Research question number two was what additional standards should be included. The panel of experts suggested that a total of 80 quality indicators um, would be important to examine, and out of those 80, they, they agreed upon 45 of them that needed to be included in the quality scorecard. After you add these 45 indicators to those 25 from the original IHEP study, that yields a total of 70 quality indicators. If additional standards were suggested, would they fall into the already identified themes or would new themes emerge? The panel suggested 20 different new categories, but yet they only came to consensus on three of them as being um, uh, important to, for the scorecard. The two new ones, uh, the three new ones actually were technology support and then student and social engagement. The third was instructional design, but it, but it was combined with the already existing course development category. As you can see now, there are nine categories or themes of the scorecard. The area of student support received the most suggestions for indicators with 11 of those achieving consensus out of the 16. 
and those were added to the scorecard. Evaluation and assessment received 14 suggestions with eight being approved. The core structure category received 12 and only five of those were approved. Technology support received four and three of those achieved consensus. The course development received 11 with eight. And institutional support um, had 10, but four, only, only the four of those achieved consensus. And then you can see on faculty support had six and then half of those achieved consensus. The new category, social and student engagement, only received one suggested indicator and only the, and that one was uh, approved for the scorecard. The final question, what values would be assigned to the recommended standards that would ultimately yield a numeric scorecard? The panel of experts agreed that the 70 quality indicators could potentially be worth three points each. Zero would mean not observed, one point would mean insufficient, the uh, two points would be moderate use, and three points would be completely meets the criteria. And you can see here on the slide that they're defined, uh, the administrator for one point, the administrator has found a slight existence of the quality standard, but much improvement is still needed. And then two points, the administrator has found there to be a moderate use, and then three points found that the quality standard is being fully implemented and there's no need for improvement in this area. So a perfect score would be 210 points. And uh, then we broke it into uh, a ranking of an exemplary program would be uh, 90 to 99 percent of those points, 189 to 209 points. Uh, where little improvement is needed, uh, 80 to 89 percent would be acceptable where some improvement is recommended, and then so on down the line. Anything scoring below uh, 59 percent, below 125 percent, then that would be um, unacceptable. But really, it, the, the good part of this is, is it just gives you a place to be able to work from and be able to improve, and I'm going to cover that a little bit later. The Sloan Consortium has endorsed the quality scorecard and are providing wonderful research sources for institutions to be able to use this tool, and that's what I want to show you now. On the Sloan C website, you can find a copy of the scorecard that you may freely use. Now remember, there are nine categories. I'm going to show you those uh, from the website, just pictures of those from the website so you can see how they're kind of broken out. Um, the first one is institutional support, and it had four uh, quality indicators. The next is technology support, and it has six quality indicators, three from the original IHEP study and then three additional ones that the panel added. Course development and instructional design has uh, 12 indicators, four of those were from the original their versions that from the original IHEP study and then the uh, other eight are were added by the panel. The course structure category has eight quality indicators with three of those being from the original study. And here I actually put two on this slide. Um, teaching and learning category has five uh, indicators and three of those from, from, from the original and then social and student engagement, there's the one students should be provided a way to interact with other students in an online community. Faculty support has six indicators now with uh, three of those being from the original study. Student support, it was by far our largest category. It has um, it has uh, 17 quality indicators uh, now, uh, with, with three, uh, four being from the original study. And then the last category is evaluation and assessment, and there are 11 quality indicators there, with three being from the original study. SONC-C has also developed an interactive version for, um, for use. Your institution must be an institutional member of Sloan-C to access this version, but this site is very, um, it, it's very 
it's 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 a great resource because of what it can offer. And I'm I'm going to walk you through that. It can actually it allows you to select your score, but then also provide justification notes and upload artifacts such as org charts and faculty training materials and survey salts, survey results, just like you would um, if your creditor were coming to visit. You have to, gain, you have to gather all that documentation. You could upload anything that you would have to substantiate the score that you've chosen. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm, I see. I'm seeing that they're asking if I'd like to stop and take a few questions. Sure. Um, can y'all give me those? Can y'all feed me those questions? And I'll be happy to to start addressing some of those. Does anyone anyone want to grab the microphone and voice their question at this point, or um, we can go through some of the ones that are in the chat area? Janet, would you like to help with that? Sure, this is Janet. Hey, there were a couple of questions about um, getting more detail about each of the indicators, and that detail is provided in the handbook, which will be available for purchase by non-members and free to members. So that should be up on the website this week. Uh, people can also find the background of the study in your JLN article in volume 14.4 which is also on the website. Then the next question has to do with next steps, which I believe you're going to develop at the end of the presentation. And this is with regard to inter-rater reliability and what institutions have uh, implemented the scorecard. And uh, so I'll leave that for the uh, closing remarks. OK, great. Thank you, Janet. Well, I think that you've answered those questions so far. And yes, I am going to be talking about next steps and, and where we're headed. So the screen now that I'm showing is uh, what you would see if you were accessing the interactive version of the scorecard. So under the Edit tab, I would choose to type in the title of my program that I was evaluating. And then from the little drop down menu, I would select my school name. And then you can see over on the left side of the screen are the nine different categories. So if you click on each of those categories, it's going to bring up those sets of indicators for that particular category. So here I've clicked on institutional support. And I would go through and select my score. And so after I've selected my score for each one of those indicators in that particular category, I would then move to the, the WYSIWYG editor that I would create my justifications for, for why I chose the score that I did. And in that justification, if I were uploading artifacts to support that score, then I would address those in my justification. So you can see, uh, number one, I had, um, I had I wanted them to know that I had um, put up an organizational structure, my, my org chart, because the, the quality indicator was about institutional governance. And then I've also attached a diagram of how the decision-making process is. It also involves faculty and administrators and often students. And that was a PDF file that I uploaded. And then I, uh, number two, I justified that by that we have a policy in place for student authentication. And then I put that policy as an upload and so on. So I would move through each justification and upload those artifacts. And this is not something that can be done very quickly because you're going to want to have to research and find all of the supporting documents to be able to support those, those scores. Once that I've gone through and justified that particular category, I would then move to the bottom and I would click Save or I would click Preview. Now, the uh, documents that you can upload, actually, it will accept text files, Word documents, and PDF files. So once I click Save, I could then see my results or preview uh, to take a look at and well and then go back into the edit mode. So this is what it looks like once I've clicked um, Save or Preview. You can see it's got my name, my institution's name, 
And then this is the first category I filled out. And you can see I scored three points for each. And then below, you can see my comments where I justified it. And then the supporting documents would be listed under that um, for each of those justifications. Way before I began the research on quality um, programs, Sloan C had developed the Sloan C Quality Framework. And this is for institutions to measure progress towards goals they set in the areas of learning effectiveness, access, faculty, and student satisfaction and scale. The interactive quality scorecard actually dovetails perfectly with the Sloan C framework so that you can actually see your results of the scorecard displayed by those five pillars of quality as well as the nine categories within the scorecard. So you would click on the pillars tab inside the interactive scorecard and then you could see that uh, under the access pillar, those particular um, indicators are going to be uh, associated with that. So why would I want to bother with this process? If you take the time to use the quality scorecard, in reality, it can really become a self-study of your online program that could be reviewed by an accreditor for quality uh, education or, or quality evaluation. You'd want to be sure to develop justifications for each of those scores and have the documentation ready. That's very similar to the process that I've had to do for um, our SACS review, where uh, my institution is actually accredited by the Southern Association of Colleges and Schools. And we have to we have to develop a self study at, for each time they review, and we have to have supporting documentation. Um, my own program, which is I believe is a very very good program, very full of quality, would not score a perfect score on this scorecard. And for me, that's great because I immediately began evaluating this and trying to develop develop improvement strategies for those indicators that I could not score my program a three. And it, this also helps with the strategic planning and the continuous improvement. This is actually going to become part of my annual goal assessment each year for SACS. We knew that the scorecard users would benefit from an additional document that explains each indicator more clearly so that program administrators would know how to rate each quality indicator within the program. Several of the panel members and myself developed a handbook that can be used to further explain the categories. And each indicator has a more in-depth explanation and recommendations for best practices. This is a work in progress and will continue to improve. It's actually available for download from Sloan C or in a print version. I would like to do um, further research with a group of online ed administrators who would use the scorecard to self-assess their program and report their findings so that we can work on our process for benchmarking, which we are actually working on now at Sun C to figure out a way, or, or actually we've, we're working on a way to uh, be able to benchmark um, programs anonymously. Uh, Sun C has developed a community of practice website that it's a commons area that we can continue our, our discussion on the quality scorecard and the indicators and work on any necessary refinement that, uh, may, be ne that may be needed. So for our next steps, we invite you to become part of that community of practice where each week we will focus on one of the categories in the scorecard. We are working on the benchmarking process now so that you can anonymously compare programs but we want you to know that any information you upload would remain private. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my expert panel, some of whom I believe are attending today. They were wonderful to work with, and their years of experience made this possible. Um, they, they, it was a six-month process that we, that we did. And I also wanted to thank Sloan C, because as long as I've been involved in online education, you've been there helping to advance quality online education. And we are so grateful that, that you're there. And I can see lots of people clapping. 
There's also, um, here's a list of all the institutions that were involved in the study. thought you might like to take a look. So um, I tried to think of a few potential questions that you might have, and I'm certainly going to take questions um, at the end of the presentation, but let me just kind of go over a few now. Uh, I thought you might want to know how this is different from the Quality Matters rubric. Quality Matters is a course rubric, and it focuses on course development and quality courses, whereas the Quality Scorecard examines an entire program, and quality course development is one piece of that scorecard. Why are these quality indicators important? Because a panel of experts were brought to consensus through the Delphi study and that we had 43 very seasoned administrators who I'd like to add were not just administrators, but most of them also had a lot of time teaching online as well. Uh, you can use the scorecard freely without constraints. It's free to use, but to be able to use the interactive scorecard on the website, you must be a Sloan C institutional member. Uh, will Sloan C be convening special interest groups around this? Yes, I mentioned the common site uh, that's uh, already ready to go that we would like you to be a part of. Why should Sloan C endorse the scorecard since it doesn't have everybody's input? Well, it did have a panel of experts with nine or more years of experience, but we are inviting you to join our common site and participate in ongoing discussions, uh, and we will be continuing to, to review the scorecard and, and look for improvements. Why is the scorecard uh, based on input, input-based and not on outputs? The scorecard offers broad goals for outputs, but it focuses on things that administrators have influence on. You would use outputs in some of the uh, assessment process because you're going to need to be surveying for student satisfaction and faculty satisfaction and, and taking those outputs and, and uh, incorporating that into your overall assessment. Can you give the scorecard to others? Yes, absolutely. Um, here is a tiny URL link that you can use. It's, it's right on the front page. There's a link on the very front page of Sloan C that you can get to it. Uh, they've been great putting it in a great place on the website where everybody can see it. Will my information be private or public? It's going to remain private. We will not share the information that you provide. Will we be comparing scores? That's what we're working on now is that process that would compare them anonymously by groups of peer institutions. So I'm a small faith-based institution and I would like to be able to see the results of other small faith-based institutions. How can we see the how can we use the results from others to help? You could see where your uh, what other programs' strengths are and see what they've used maybe as documentation or, or justifications. Why isn't the score normalized? The expert panel felt that the graduated scale of zero to three points per indicator was the best measure. Three points times seventy is two hundred and ten points, but that. 100 point is something that we're going to look at uh, in further review uh, of the scorecard. How can I obtain a consultation on my program? We're developing a business model now and have some of the expert panelists that um, are using the scorecard and could help with that evaluation, that consultation. So you can just send your request to me or to uh, anyone at the phone consortium. What if I already have a list of standards that I use? Uh, that's great. The scorecard should be able to mesh with other standards easily. Uh, the Sloan C pillars uh, of quality did align easily. I know of another institution that has something that they call the gold standards, and that is aligning uh, very easily from what they're reporting. So. Um, the, the, identification, the identification of quality online education programs satisfies a great need in our field and has been requested by many online education administrators as a tool for program improvement. 
The assessment of quality online education has never been more important as fierce competition for many programs continue to increase and students all over the world are clicking to find a respectable degree program. Quality in education really does matter as the ultimate impact is to our students. So I hope that you can find this worthwhile and I would love to take a few questions. Okay, folks, um, what we're going to ask you to do is uh, to please uh, click on the hand with the little green arrow pointing upward if you'd like to use your mic. And the mic is in the bottom left corner. It's a toggle. You can't use it right now uh, because both uh, available mics are being used. So what I'm going to do is release the mic. And as you raise your hand, uh, Kay will be able to call on you in order. Uh, if you let me just raise mine so you can see, and hopefully you can do that too. It's the hand with the little green arrow. I I don't really have a question, <laughs> but uh, there were a lot of questions that came into the chat area, so hopefully people will take the opportunity to ask questions now. Okay. And if you would rather just use the chat area for your questions, please feel free to do so. I think I did see one question uh, that I'm not sure that I addressed. Uh, somebody asked about um, interreliability and if uh, we had, you know, the data in. We just uh, really released the scorecard and the interactive site, and we really didn't even announce it. So people, I think, kind of just found it. So we don't have anybody that's completed it, including myself, because it takes a while to gather all of that data uh, and all of those inputs. In fact, right now I'm in the middle of my student satisfaction survey process for my online students, so I won't even have that data till next week. So uh, we don't have that yet, but we are. We, there are there are many institutions that have already, there are several institutions that have already joined the site, the interactive site, and begun to enter their data, but we don't have that yet. But we are looking forward to that process being completing and completed and for us to be able to, to get together and, uh, and work on that. Okay, hey, uh, this is Janet again. I wanted to add in response, partly response to Kelvin's very good question. Yes, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to get institutions together to provide and compare quantitative data uh, for benchmarking. And in fact, we are hoping that we'll be able to put together a workshop or a panel for the ALN conference this fall with uh, reports coming back uh, from various institutions. I think a lot of people would be interested in seeing those findings. How many of you have already um, looked at the scorecard on the website, taken a look at it, and kind of gone through the indicators? Can you? Per, yeah, few give, of you give, give us a green check mark if you've oh, done yeah. it. Yeah, quite a few. Great, great. Well, you have my email address, so feedback would be great if you want to send me feedback. Um, on what you're seeing, and um, this, the handbook is, uh, you know, we're continuing to, we're going to continue to keep that updated as well, so uh, so that you can have that, you know, those those indicators better defined. Looks like we have a question from Catherine. Hi, Catherine. Maybe not. Um, the microphone is in the bottom left-hand corner of the screen. It's a toggle. If you click on it, you can speak, and then you need to click on it to release it for the next person. So uh, don't be shy. Voice your questions. It's quicker than typing.
We have a question from Mary. Mary, you want to grab the mic? Mary, Mary you want to grab the mic? Oops. Mary, you need to click on the mic on the bottom left corner of the screen, and then you can speak. Okay, can you hear me now? Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Hi, Kay. Uh, Kay, I wanted to say hi, and uh, I've enjoyed uh, communicating with you through email, and um, working on this project, and I wanted to know um, when the handbook might be available online. Okay, you do need to turn your mic back on. I think that's going to be the next day or two. Janet, would you like to answer that? Yeah, I see that Janet's answered in the chat. Yeah, Janet's answered in the chat. Yes, it'll be ready any minute now, in fact, but definitely this week unless we run into some unforeseen production problems, and you'll see it uh, right on the home page as well. Kelvin, I see your um, comment about having uh, clear definitions about the online and hybrid. Yes, that's a very good comment, and uh, we will absolutely incorporate that. Hi, Peter. Um, I don't know about Lumina's process. Could you give me some more information? Do you have a microphone that you could talk? Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Uh, we can't hear you right now. You need to turn the microphone on. It'll appear yellow when it's live, so then you need to turn it off when you're done. Okay. Well, now can you hear me now? Yep. Yep. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay. I like the, the process you've used to put this together, and that's not the point of my question um, at all. But it's it's the next steps, uh, the process for the next steps. And what Lumina has done is is published a uh, what I'm going to call a degree qualifications structure um, that is not the Bologna type thing, but an adaptation of that based on a lot of study of different frameworks. But then what they're doing, the next stage, they're encouraging people to adapt and adopt. In other words, to, to look at all of that and say, here's how we're going to deal with that, and here's why. And then collect metrics from what will be, I assume, several discrete ways of dealing with um, what they have produced, and then see if they, as they look at all that data from different ways, if they actually find through practice a preferred ultimate final um, product or multiple final products. I'm not sure it lends itself as well to what you've initiated here. But that's my question is that it allows for people to interpret what you've created and, and put themselves on the line to say, Here's, how, here's what we're going to do because we think these things are more, for us are more important and here's why and then collect data on it and see essentially if there are more or less effective combinations by institutional type or by student type or whatever. Well, thank you, Peter. That sounds fascinating. I, uh, I will be, as soon as I'm hanging up from this, I will be going straight to their website and trying to find out more information. So if you could, if you have any links that you could send me more information, I'd love to investigate that. Well, don't don't confuse me with Lumina. Uh, <laughs> but the woman at Lumina that you would want to uh, um, connect with ultimately is a woman named Holly McTiernan. Um, 
and uh, you'll, you'll see this project on the Lumina website. But it's, this is just a process question, and it, it may not fit, you know, it may not align with how you guys are doing this, but I just thought, it, it, on the other hand, it might, and it might give you a, a, a better second and third stage. Yeah, that's great. I, I do appreciate that. Um, Kelvin, I see your question about there being discussion about essential criteria. Yes, and I actually left that off of my notes, but one of the suggestions from the from the research from the panel was to establish a minimum criteria for each category. And um, they suggested it, but the panel never brought anything forward on it. And so that is one of my next steps. Uh, that I meant to cover as well. So yes, there will be. We are going to be looking at an essential criteria. Let's see, Eva. Let me answer your question. And have you done any research so far on values and impacts of doing benchmarking this way? No, uh, I haven't. Uh, I am. I'm had really concentrated on the scorecard and. Uh, taking it step by step, but I will certainly look into that and see, do you know of any research studies on benchmarking that you can share? And then your other question is, how did you come up with the criteria? The criteria uh, for each of the indicators, um, I'm not sure your question, what your what criteria you're referencing. Could you um, maybe clarify that? If you're wondering about how we came up with the indicators, those were suggested from the panel, but remember we used those original 24 from the Institute for Higher Education Policy Study. Oh, you're doing research by, oh great, great. Well, if you want to share some of that or give me some more information, I would love to have that. Are there any other questions that we can answer? We sure hope that you will um, take a look at the scorecard and and uh, you know start taking down some notes, jotting some notes down about each of the categories and and where you think you know you'll be able to answer those with your program. Uh, it's really been uh, eye-opening for me. Uh, I will I will tell you that I cannot score a three on the category of the indicator for social and student engagement because I do not have a separate place for my students to have community. There is a place within each of the courses for them to have community, but I don't have a place for them to hang out virtually. And that is uh, one of the suggestions. So I'm going to be looking at, at that and developing a, um, a, a resource for that. So if there aren't any more questions, I sure appreciate you um, attending today and I hope that this met your, uh, met, I hope this, I hope this uh, satisfied your curiosity about the scorecard and I do hope that you'll take the time to use it and provide feedback for us. We are really interested in your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kay, um, and thank you for everyone for joining us today. This